Today's webinar is an update on the ADS legislation and the changes that are coming into force on the 1st of April. Now, I'm joined today by Alan Barr, a partner in our personal and family department, and Isabel Denverno, who is a director in the corporate tax and incentives team alongside myself, Bob Langridge. We've got a few things to cover off today, so if we just flip to the next slide. Firstly, we'll look at the background to the changes and the changes to the time limits for disposing and replacing residences. Next, I will cover off the new rules about joint buyers and single economic units, and then we'll hand over to Alan, who will talk about his favorite things being death, divorce, and small shares. Then a brief bit on a new relief for local authorities and onto the questions. So I'll now hand over to Isabel to talk through the background to these changes. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us to talk about the ADS changes. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, it's been a long time coming. It started with, or they started with, um, a call for evidence back in 2021. And um, last year we had consultation on the proposed legislation and it um, all culminated in the um, Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Order 2024, which was approved by the Scottish Parliament not that long ago, on 6th of March, in fact. Um, the first point about all of these reforms is that they are all taxpayer friendly, um, but they are so certainly not a simplification. Um, unfortunately, so there's quite a lot of different points to consider. Moving on to the next slide, you can see the approval of the SSI on the um, 6th of March. And um, moving on to the next slide, um, the Revenue Scotland guidance has been updated to deal with the changes. Um, and Revenue Scotland themselves are running webinars on the 20th of March and the 21st of March. So if you would like to sign up for those, you can do so on the Revenue Scotland website. Um, but the guidance, as I say, has been updated, though I'm sure Revenue Scotland would appreciate any comments from users if there are points that are not clear or need further explanation. So the first sort of headline point, as we can see on the next um, slide is the time limit changes of 18 months to 36 months. Um, the If we move on to the next slide, you can see that uh, in some ways it's really quite simple. Under the current rules, if you're replacing your main residence and you buy a new one within 18 months of selling the former one and you've lived in the former one uh, at any point within the 18 months before you bought the new main residence, you don't pay ADS. And those um, time limits are changing to 36 months from 1st April 2024. So if you buy a new main residence within 36 months, and it's actually now become before or after selling the former main residence, and you've lived in the former main residence at any time within the 36 months, then there's no ADS. But on the next slide, we'll see the important message to take away which is that these new ADS rules on replacement of main residence only apply if you buy the new main residence on or after the 1st of April 2024. So that's a really important point to understand. On claiming a repayment of ADS, it's similar. The old rules, you pay ADS in the first place, as we know, but then you can reclaim it if you sell within 18 months and you've lived in the former main residence in the 18 months before the new main residence was bought. Under the new rules, um, it's pay ADS, but you can reclaim. And that's if you sell the former main residence within 36 months and you've lived in it um, in the 36 months before the new main residence was bought. But to, to um, reiterate the same really important message on the next slide, these new rules only apply if you buy the new main residence on or after 1st April 2024. And we think there is scope for confusion here with people thinking that um, they the old, uh, uh, e even if you haven't bought your new main residence after 1st April, 
um, the new rules will apply and you'll get the 36 months, but you won't. It's only if you buy on or after 1st April. And Alan will talk about some things that you might want to consider before 1st April 2024. Um, right, I'll hand over now to uh, Bob to talk about some really difficult aspects of the new legislation. Bob. Thank you, Isabel. Yes, this is very much an example of me having drawn the short straw, which means collectively we have all drawn the short straw. Um, there's a few things to cover on joint buyers and single economic units. Why are the rules changing what the changes are? I'm going to attempt to give you a practical way of navigating these changes because the legislation is now while it's taxpayer friendly, it is definitely not tax advisor friendly. And then a couple of worked examples so you can see the implications of these changes. So first up, why are these rules being rewritten? Single economic unit rules, that is the idea that you are treated as owning certain things that are owned by close people in your life, being spouses, civil partners, cohabitants, and parents of minor children are treated as owning what their children own. These rules are quite one-sided. Most people intuitively interpret them as meaning you're treated as owning what these people own and you're treated as selling what they sell. However, you're only treated as owning what they own and only for the purposes of deciding whether you fall into the ADS or not. In other words, when you are counting up, do I own two or more dwellings? The joint buyer rules are, again, a bit of a minefield at the moment because they are one-sided. And this current scheme of the legislation operates what I call a one-in, all-out effect. That is, it only takes one joint buyer out of however many buyers to trigger the ADS to make it payable. But as soon as one joint buyer has triggered the ADS, then all of the joint buyers need to qualify for the exemption or the repayment in order to switch that ADS off or get the ADS payment back again. And this is best illustrated by one of the most surprising decisions uh, to come out in the last few years, which is Crawford against Revenue Scotland. And just summarize this briefly on the next slide. So Dr. Crawford and his partner, Ms. Smith, lived separately. They each had a main residence that they owned in their own sole names. They didn't own anything else. They decided to live together. So they bought a house in joint names. And on the day they bought it, 17 December, Dr. Crawford sold his old home. Ms. Smith had retained hers. Therefore, the ADS was payable, one in, all out. On the 5th of February, two years later, she, Mrs. S, sold her prior main residence. This was within the 18-month window in force at the time, so they submitted a request to repay the ADS. Now, at this point, they had both disposed of a prior main residence, Dr. Crawford on the date of purchase and Ms. Smith within 18 months after. So you would think that logically and reasonably they should be able to recover the ADS, but they couldn't. Revenue Scotland felt they had to apply the law exactly as written, and so they rejected the claim. The couple appeared to the first-tier tribunal, and the tribunal upheld Revenue Scotland's position and really doubled down on this all-in, sorry, one-in, all-out position. Specifically, they said that all the buyers have to qualify for the same basis of exemption or recovery. Uh, because Dr. Crawford had already disposed of his main residence, he could not then dispose of it in the 18 months after, so he did not meet the recovery conditions. And maybe a standout from the judgment is just this little quote on the next slide. That we accept that had Dr. Crawford sold the first property the day after the effective date, so if he'd sold it one day later, or if the parties had cohabited, then the ADS would have been repaid. That kind of encapsulates everything that was wrong with the joint buyer and single economic unit rules, and they are the source of one of the larger groups of unfair decisions that you get. So let's look at how these are being changed. First of all, 
the single economic unit rule is being extended. The bit in blue here is the extension to include disposals of properties by someone in your economic unit. But that disposal is only taken into account for the purposes of paragraph eight. And we'll look at paragraph eight in a moment. Key to these single economic unit rules is understanding where they do and don't apply. You count ownership of other dwellings only for the purposes of the two plus rule. Do you own two or more dwellings and get into ADS? And you only count disposals for the purposes of paragraph eight, which is now uh, the main paragraph, I think, dealing with exemption and reclaims. Next up, what are the changes to the joint buyer rules? Here we have paragraph 8.1, which has been amended first to add in the 36 months. But 8.1a is now both a reclaim and an exemption provision. And you'll see that it covers joint buyer situations. And it says that where you have joint buyers, only one of them needs to have disposed of uh, a dwelling. B covers the requirement for residence in the dwelling disposed of. And again, you can see that only one buyer on the face of B needs to have lived in the dwelling disposed of in, as their main residence. And C uh, sets out a condition that all the buyers need to live in the new property as their main residence. But the crux of these provisions is really this mysterious bit at the bottom, paragraph 81D. And what this is doing is it's telling you how many buyers in a joint buyer situation actually need to satisfy the rules in 81A and 81B. If we go on to the next slide. This leaves us with what I kind of think of as Rube Goldberg legislation. If you don't know what a Rube Goldberg machine is, when you get these slides, click on the link there. It will become wonderfully clear to you. But we now have a situation where we have potentially four interactive exemption or reclaim provisions, paragraph 2.2, which is the original replacement of main residence exemption, paragraph 8, which covers exemptions and reclaims for single and joint buyers, paragraph 8a, which extends paragraph 8 in situations where the buyers are a couple, and paragraph 9a, which extends the original replacement main residence relief for situations where the buyers are a couple. The interaction of these is really complicated, but get to the next slide. In my view, a lot of these are now redundant. Now, I, there isn't time to talk about why I think that redundancy arises, but if you see the link here at the bottom, I've written quite a long blog looking in detail at the interaction of these rules. And my conclusion is that really, and for all practical purposes, the main things to focus on in joint buyer scenarios are, or indeed any scenarios, are paragraph 2, 1, which is your basic charging provision, and paragraph 8, which deals with exemptions and reclaims. And the key to unlocking and understanding how these work are really paragraph 5, about single economic units, and paragraph 8, 1D that how many buyers need to satisfy the conditions rule. So looking in detail about how these work, paragraph 81D tells us how many of the buyers need to meet 81A, disposing of a main property, and 81B, who lived in that property as a main residence. And the way I read it is that if all the buyers own an additional dwelling, then every single buyer needs to satisfy 81A and 81B. So they all need to have made or be deemed to have made a disposal, and they all need to have lived in one of those disposed properties as a main residence. Now, they don't all need to have lived together, but they all need to have lived in a main residence and disposed of it. The quirk to 81D is that we ignore, when we're looking at 
who owns, how many buyers own an additional dwelling, we are going to ignore the single economic unit rules effectively because that imputed ownership under paragraph five only applies for the purposes of 21C, that is the two or more test. So really, when you're looking at 81D, you're counting actual ownership, what you own in your own name. You are looking at certain trusts, namely bear trusts and trusts where there is what we would call an interest in possession or a right to occupy the property or get income from it. You are looking at assets held in partnership where one of the buyers is a partner. And quite oddly, you are also including small shares worth less than £40,000, even though these are excluded for other purposes. So it's really about actual ownership here. That is key. Next slide. So really, when you're looking at a joint buyer situation now, there are two sets of questions you're going to have to ask. Firstly, looking at paragraph 2.1, is the ADS activated? And the question here is, do any, does one single or more buyer own two or more dwellings at the time of purchase? For this, you count dwellings that are owned by members of a single economic unit. And if the answer is yes, at least one of our buyers owns more than one thing, then the ADS is potentially activated. If the answer is no, stop there. There isn't going to be any ADS unless it is a purchase in the course of a property letting business. Next up, you have to ask, is there an exemption? And for this, we go to paragraph eight. And I think the logical place to start is 81D. Work out how many buyers need to pass our tests for exemption. And if all of the buyers, ignoring what other members of their single economic units, if all of the buyers own additional dwellings to the one they've just purchased, then all the buyers must pass the test. And if only some of the buyers, again, ignoring what other single economic unit members might own, have additional dwellings, then only one buyer needs to pass these tests. But again, just to reiterate, that's only for the disposal and did you live in the old disposed of residence tests? All of your buyers still need to live in the new dwelling as their main residence. So next slide. Once we've established how many buyers need to pass the tests, then we just work through 81A or an 81B and 81C. And I've, I've tried to parse out the tests here as they would apply in either situation. And that will tell you whether or not there is a reclaim available or an exemption available. If we go now to a couple of worked examples, for me, the litmus test as to whether this legislation is successful is, does it successfully deal with this decision in Crawford? And in my view, this new legislation does successfully deal with the situation in Crawford. Now, this is a simplified analysis on the slide. Again, if you want to look at the more technical analysis, go to the, the blog I linked to earlier. But here, I think you get into quite a good position for the Crawfords. First of all, just on exactly the same facts, at the date of purchase, Miss S does own an actual second property, her prior main residence, and therefore, you're potentially within the ADS charge. So we need to look at who needs to pass the conditions for exemption. And here, in my view, only one buyer out of Dr. Crawford and Miss Smith needed to meet the exemption conditions. And that is because only Dr. Crawford at this point owns more than one dwelling. Sorry, Dr. Crawford only owns one dwelling, Ms. Smith owns two. Because we're ignoring single economic units, we're not going to impute Ms. Smith's ownership to Dr. Crawford. So only one buyer needs to satisfy these tests. Dr. Crawford has disposed of a dwelling. He disposed of one on the date of purchase, and that's included in the prior 36 months. 
81B, slight typo on the slide, it says D there, it should be 81B, is met because Dr. Crawford lived in that dwelling in the prior 36 months. And 81C is met because Dr. Crawford and Miss S both live in the new dwelling as their main residence. So under this new legislation, they don't even have to go and reclaim the ADS. They are exempted up front. That is, to my mind, a very good result. And a lot of the unfair or unusual situations that arise with joint buyers, I think, are now resolved. But I do still think that Crawford-type cases can arise, and some of the original oddities of the legislation can still bite. So there are still bear traps in here. And like Crawford, these really arise, in my view, in situations where a couple has lived apart and then buy together. So if we go on to example two, let's take civil partners, Danforth and Edmund. Well, they won't be civil partners at this point. They are a couple, though. They are buying a new main residence together in joint names. They currently live apart. Danforth owns his main residence and a share in an inherited property. Edmund owns his property and nothing else. And on the date of purchasing a new residence, they've both had their, their flats up for sale. Danforth manages to sell his on the date of entry, but Edmund hasn't found a buyer yet. How does this wash out under the new legislation? Well, unfortunately, the ADS is going to apply here. Again, the ADS is potentially activated because now both buyers definitely own two or more dwellings on the date of purchase. And when we go on to our next step, how many buyers need to meet the conditions for exemption? All of them do, because both Danforth and Edmund actually own more than one dwelling on the date of entry. Danforth owns the inherited property and his pro and diviso share of the new one, and Edmund owns his prior main residence and his share of the new one. Therefore, we need to make sure that 81A, 81B, 81C are passed by everyone. And here, 81A, you might argue that that has failed. You could argue it is passed, but it depends on factual analysis. Are Danforth and Edmund cohabitants as at the date of entry? If they are not, then Edmund hasn't disposed of a dwelling and he cannot count Danforth's dwelling. If they are, then okay, you pass 81A, but that doesn't really help you because when you get to 81B, Edmund hasn't lived in Danforth's flat as his prior main residence. So 81B has failed. 81C is met. But because you've definitely failed 81B, you are not going to get the exemption. And what's worse, if we go on to the next slide, it looks like you're not going to be able to reclaim that tax either. Why? Well, it all depends on at what date do you assess 81D if you're doing a reclaim. And I think logically you are looking at the position at the effective date of the purchase. So when you bought the new property in question. And if that's right, we still need to have all of Danforth and Edmund meeting the conditions for recovery. That is going to be impossible on the same basis as it was impossible in Crawford. So there is still a potential issue there. I hope that when things like this come up in practice, the revenue will take a pragmatic approach to, to dealing with them or might accept that you can assess 81D at the date of disposal to see who needs to meet the conditions at the time of disposal. But it gets even more twisty because irre seemingly irrelevant things become important here as well. If Edmund's prior home was sold first and they kept Danforth's, and that could just be down to who is willing to buy what property, it could be a total twist of fate thing. If they sold Edmund's home 
then when you look at 81D, I think you only need one buyer to meet all the tests because Edmund only owns one property. Danforth owns two. So not everyone owns two. Therefore, you can get away with satisfying the test on just Edmund's sale alone. And I cannot think of a single good policy reason why that would be the case. And yet I think that is a consequence of the legislation. So in summary, I think these rules are difficult. If you were to follow the legislation exactly, it is more complicated than I've laid out here. But taking a practical approach, if you work through paragraph two and paragraph eight in the way I've suggested, starting with 81D, I think that gets you to the same place every time. The new legislation resolves a lot of problems, but be wary, some of these historical issues can still re-arise. Now I'll hand over to Alan to talk about death, divorce, and small care. Thanks, Bob. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and um, I want to talk about a, a couple of things. If you can move on to the, the first slide, please. Um, it's my usual cheery subjects, death, divorce, disaster, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, starting with death. Now then, um, I, I propose to offer a prize, a prize of a bottle of alcoholic or non-alcoholic fizzy wine for the uh, first uh, person who successfully meets the conditions of this relief, uh, this apparent uh, uh, new relief that has been brought in, which I think is uh, barely going to uh, be useful for anyone. Um, it's a new paragraph, a new actual relief. Uh, the buyer owns two or more dwellings in the effective date of purchase. Well, that's what brings ADS into the game already. Um, uh, the uh, thing that it's aimed against is what I will call unintended ownership of a second dwelling. Um, so here, the, the, the dwelling other than the one that uh, you uh, are buying uh, has been come into your ownership sometime after the conclusion of missives, but before the effective date. And the effective date is the date of settlement. Now, I know that all you conveyancers out there, uh, there are occasions when you will have um, an actual gap between conclusion of missives and settlement, uh, but I know how relatively rare they are. I suppose uh, builders' missives uh, do happen occasionally on that. Uh, but here, you have got to have your inherited dwelling at some time uh, be before uh, the effective date, but after conclusion of missives. So that's going to be rare. Um, how did you acquire that second dwelling? Um, one, by transfers from the executors of a deceased person, or two, otherwise as a result of the death. Now, going on um, with that, that is going to be very rare. It's going to be very rare indeed, notably because if it's a dwelling you've inherited in Scotland, you control when you receive it. Um, the, the executors don't just transfer it to you uh, immediately after the death, uh, with some considerable time after the death usually, and you don't have to accept it. So you have that uh, absolutely um, uh, in your control and you don't have to uh, fall into, as it were, the need for this relief. The second possibility is that you inherit um, uh, otherwise as a result of a death. In other words, not through the transfer of executors, but by survivorship, but by survivorship. And now that will happen. It will happen, uh, for example, in proper life rents, um, where the proper life renter dies and bang, the fear owns the property immediately. Now, if that unfortunate event happens after you've concluded misses for a new purchase, so that at the time of settlement, you come to own a, sec a, a second dwelling, therefore liable for ADS, well, you can escape it as a result of this new exemption. But frankly, that is going to be rare. The other situation where that will occur, may occur, is on foreign systems. Remember that additional dwelling supplement applies if your additional dwelling is anywhere in the world, or if Mr. Musk is his way uh, on the moon or Mars as well, um, then if you inherit it there, uh, because of the legal system of the moon, the Mars, or anywhere else, uh, immediately on a death, then this relief might just be uh, might just be of value to you, but otherwise, I don't think it's going to be of much value, frankly, to anyone. Okay, if we can move on. Uh, as I said, there uh, we can always refuse delivery of a transfer. You don't need to take it. The inheritance by survivorship is relatively rare. 
um, uh, but it will happen. And as I say, foreign systems, including possibly English law, I've discussed this with some of my English colleagues about what rights you actually acquire on death um, uh, with their strange rules of equitable ownership. Uh, and certainly as far as specific legacies of dwellings go, then you might gain it uh, that way. But it's not going to apply very often, and as I say, pretty well never to inheritance of further Scottish dwellings. Okay, on we go, please. Uh, and we now come to something that is welcome and will be a lot more common, uh, but does need um, a, a bit of work, uh, not quite as much work of working out as Bob had in his section, uh, but uh, does need a, a bit of thought. Um, it's dealing with the situation where a couple um, either and it's important, either married or civil partners, not cohabitants. There's nothing in this for cohabitants. But um, you have a married couple or civil partners who split up. And what usually happens in such situations is that one leaves the partnerial home uh, and the other stays there. Um, and if this happens, uh, the person who has left then wants to move on and to buy a new dwelling. And of course, they may still own all or part of the dwelling in which they no longer live. Um, so um, this is a specific release where that is the case. Uh, it has to have been the former partnerial home. They have to have been living together, together there as a couple. Uh, if that's the case, um, it has to continue. And this is a kind of odd condition because it's nothing to do with the person who's left but they have to continue to be the main residence of the, of the spouse uh, who is still there or civil partner who's still there. Um, the, the, the fourth condition is not too hard to meet because it's assumed if somebody is left and is buying a new home together, often with a new partner, uh, they don't intend to live together as husband and wife civil partners. So that one will be easy to meet. It's the last one that is, con uh, is a difficult one to meet. Why is the buyer of this new property still owning the old? And the reason that the, the reason that allows them relief is only if they meet this condition. If they are retaining ownership in their original dwelling, as I say, a share or the whole of it, only because they have come to an agreement or had a court order um, regulating their arrangements um, with their um, previous partner. Um, so it is very restricted, and you will have to, in these circumstances, uh, make sure that there is an agreement. I think it will have to be a written agreement. Um, court order is obvious enough. The type of agreement it has to be has to be in connection with, if you go on to the next slide, um, it has to be in connection with the uh, ending of their relationship. So this is only going to work if the, the parties can agree either specifically as regards the house or more generally that one is keeping the, the house and going to live in the house only as part of overall arrangements due to the end of the formal relationship. Um, and that, as I say, may require a bit of planning. I've talked to, in this case, not my English colleagues, but my, my family law colleagues. It is not uncommon to make a, a separate agreements for different assets, uh, and this can be done. But of course, you require the cooperation. An agreement is an agreement, and your ex-partner may not be too keen to reach an agreement, particularly if you're about to move in with a new partner. Um, so there's a, a room for a bit of uh, matrimonial or civil partnerial blackmail going on there. Um, and, and that, as I say, may uh, come to be a problem. I mentioned at the beginning of this section, there's nothing there at all about cohabitants. Uh, this, in my view, is, is a gap. Um, such arrangements, of course, regularly exist with cohabitations. Indeed, it will become the markers, one of the markers of cohabitation, that people own property together and there is no such provision for them. And um, some of the stuff that Bob has been talking about and indeed that Isabel mentioned at the very beginning about the extension of time to 36 months may assess cohabitants, uh, assist cohabitants who break up, but there's nothing specifically for cohabitants in this legislation. And I think that's a, a, a serious gap. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, pause there and move on to a different subject. This is a, a wholly welcome change, which Bob has mentioned already. Um, to give you the, the example background, if I, with my uh, two siblings, own a, a holiday house and the holiday house is worth a 
100,000 pounds, um, my share is worth a third of that, 33 uh, and a third thousand pounds. Um, and uh, until this change, my ownership of that share would have been treated as owning a dwelling worth 100,000 uh, pounds. And that then is being swept away. It's the size of the share that counts. Um, so that is a, a, a really useful change. Uh, it corrects what I think everybody acknowledges, including now the government was an unfairness. Um, if we're going to have a £40,000, as it were, uh, minimum limit for this, then that brings it back in for a lot more cases where you own a share of a, a holiday home. Um, uh, there's a, a note there that it's not universal, uh, and Bob has mentioned this already, again, that the £40,000 small share relief, if I can call it that, uh, does not affect uh, people um, for some of the tests uh, to do with uh, joint ownership and uh, joint disposal, as it were. Um, and there are Just to be clear, I think that's another gap in the legislation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and partnerships bring their own difficulties. Partnerships are capable of all kinds of arrangements uh, as to ownership of property, including specific um, uh, capital shares and capital property shares. Uh, and these are frankly unexplored and difficult areas. Um, okay, I'm going to stop, I think, at this point and pass you uh, to uh, very briefly to Isabel before she comes back to me. Thanks, Alan. Um, so local authorities, if we move on to the next slide, this is a very welcome change and in fact went further than people had initially asked for. Um, and it's a good example of consultation working. So purchases by local authorities from 1st April will be exempt from both LBTT and ADS. So it's not just an ADS change, it's LBTT as well. And that's in two circumstances. Firstly, um, if it's entered into under powers in Section 2 of the Housing Act, so it's powers of local authorities to provide housing accommodation, or secondly, if it's funded with a grant or other financial assistance under Section 2 of the Housing Scotland Act. So it the, the, the second one was the sort of starting place, but people um, felt and made known to the Scottish Government that extending it to cover um, other situations where local authorities were buying housing, but it wasn't necessarily funded in that way. Um, and this has been adopted in the new changes. So this is a very welcome change. And um, uh, the, I think there'll be other bodies who will also be trying to lobby for a change that would affect them. So moving back to Alan on what can you do before the new rules come in, if yeah, well, uh, you could make really, a difference. It really goes back to the fundamental that Isabel mentioned and then quite rightly mentioned again, in that the new rules apply to... Uh, transactions settling settling on or after 1st April. Um, and um, that what can you do? Well, you might choose to delay settlement. You might choose to delay settlement. Um, of course, you might choose to do it ideally by agreeing to delay settlement, um, but uh, it may be uh, even, as it were, unagreed delay of settlement could be worthwhile in a very few cases. Um, so um, the big one where this applies, if somebody lasted a main residence uh, more than 18 months ago, but not more than 36 months ago, um, they cannot qualify to replace their main residence if they settle before um, 1st April. If they wait to settle afterwards, then they can bring in uh, the replacement of main residence provisions um, and uh, allow that. Uh, more rarely, perhaps, they may anticipate or there may be... Uh, as it were, a known reason for a much delayed uh, disposal of an existing main residence. You'll know that you need more than 18 months, uh, but not more than 36 months, so that might be part of it. Um, the divorce one that I was dealing with in a little more detail, um, then that I think is another one where you might just want to assess uh, and delay buying your new property until uh, after the new rules have come in, or uh, in the, some of the very complex things that, that Bob has mentioned, uh, which are, uh, I agree with him, largely cured, albeit in a very complex way for joint buyers, um, but some of them will definitely be cured after 1st April and not before, and that's a reason for potentially delaying settlement. Okay. Yes, I um, just jump in to, to add actually on that last one, Alan, that I've already advised a couple of people who 
were going to buy before 1st April and would have been caught by Crawford to, to delay um, because it will get them out of Crawford when the new rules come in. So and now it... um, we've got a few minutes at the end just for questions. And we've got a couple of questions that came in because I got dropped in the hop seat. I am going to MC these and I'm going to start by taking my revenge on Alan. First question we have in, does the new legislation actually make reference to effective dates post 1st April? I could not see this, notwithstanding policy statements. Previous case law seems to focus on the strict wording of the legislation rather than policy or fairness. Now, I think this is a really good point. One of the standout things for me in the legislation that we didn't have time to talk about today is the lack of transitional provisions. But Internally, we've discussed this analysis quite a lot. So, Alan, over over to you. How do we get to to it being triggered by effective dates post first well, April for the purchases? I think I think um, either of you may disagree. I think this is simply by the actual commencement of the regulations that bring this into effect um, that they simply will not exist. Um, uh, uh, the new rules will not exist until the commencement provisions are in effect, um, and, and that does not occur until 1st April. Um, and uh, ironically, it, it's slightly the other way. If you want transitional provisions, classic case of transitional provision, if there's a, a rise in the rate, then you may well have a transitional provision that the rise in the rate does not apply to contracts concluded before the effective date of the rise. Um, and um, that, that even though settlement takes place after this. Now, there are no such transitional provisions in this. So I think it it is, a, as it were, a, a, a time cliff edge. It's 1st April for all of the new provisions. And um, uh, as I say, that includes those looking back to a period before 1st April. Everything focuses on your date of settlement um, uh, for the new rules to apply. But I think that's for what actually... it's worth, I think that's right. Yeah, I Sorry, I agree. Not... And I think it's in the SI itself, really, the commencement date. So you can't see it in the amended legislation, as it were. You know, it doesn't it doesn't say, by the way, the you know, it was different before um first April twenty twenty four. It's in it's in the SI. Sorry, Bob, I cut across you there. No, 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 that that's quite all right. Um next question. Uh, what is the impact of housing held in a discretionary trust which holds houses and the beneficiaries would like to buy a house separately with cohabiting partners or spouses? I'll start this one and then Alan will interrupt me when I say something wrong. Um, housing held in a discretionary trust, if it is a plain, ordinary discretionary trust, should not affect the beneficiaries at all because you do not imply ownership out of a discretionary trust to the trust beneficiaries. However, there are two wrinkles to that. Um, I think, number one, if that property vests in a beneficiary, so they effectively have a bear trust, then that would catch them. Slight head wiggle from Alan there. Um, and number two is if you have a discretionary trust and then you appoint property out on life rent or interest in possession, then that property will be counted uh, for the beneficiaries two plus tests. Alan, yeah, do you have uh, anything to disagree with on that? No, I, not, I agree with that. Um, discretionary trust, in the words of, of my friends, Reed and Gretton, is a separate patrimony uh, uh, from the individual ownership, both of the, of the trustees and, of course, of the beneficiaries. Um, I, I, Bob's wrinkles are both important ones because uh, that can be a route to, for example, uh, beneficiaries um, utilizing the replacement of main residence rules um, because they are imputed ownership does occur for good or ill, as it were, out of discretionary trust. Um, but essentially, if it's a true discretionary trust without other without interests having been established, other than at the discretion. Uh, and so they remain at the discretion of the trustees, then uh, what the, the individual beneficiaries or their partners or their spouses do is looked at in their own terms, and they will not be, as it were, punished for being potential beneficiaries of property in a, in a discretionary trust. Okay, thank you, Alan. So that brings us to time now. Um, 
there are a couple more questions. We will follow those up by email. Um, if anyone does have any questions, our contact details are at the end of the slide. So please do feel free to email those in and we will get back to you. Thank you.